Hi, welcome to our Sunday morning uh, message. It is uh, March the 12th, 2023, and we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. We want to thank everybody that helped with our uh, um, Grand Prix. It went very well, and a lot of volunteers, a lot of helpers, and it was uh, just a great day. Just continue to pray for the Iwana Club. Um, we're actually recording this um before Sunday, so the rains are kind of coming, and there is, uh, we're under a kind of flood warning right now here in the Grand and Planada. So just continue to pray for our area, and just pray, Lord, by the time this gets posted onto our YouTube channel, um, uh, the weekend will be done. But we just pray for protection and God's uh, sovereignty and and the hand upon this. Um, April 9th is sunrise service, and at this point, we are planning to have our sunrise service out at the end of Buchanan Hollow Road with our pancake breakfast back here at the church on that day. That's April the 9th. So let's pray. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that Deanna Montoya's surgery went well. We just continue to pray for our community as we deal with rains and potential flooding and, and just protect those that are in vulnerable areas. We pray, Father, for your blessings on our study today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the great gathering. That's where kind of scripture takes us today. Um, we did Ephesians 1, 7 last week. In him, we have redemption. And that is the, the idea that, that God's work on the cross, Christ's work on the cross, has redeemed us with his precious blood, uh, not with uh, blood of bulls and goats and, and not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with his precious blood without spot and blemish, he paid the penalty for our sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. And Jesus commended his love towards us, that demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. And so in him, we have redemption in Christ through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And so we're going to kind of follow up on that last part of verse seven, that God's love and grace is what provoked him to send his only begotten son. He so loved the world and, and love is grace. Um, and he says in verse eight, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, wisdom and the word prudence is a kind of word for understanding. In the wisdom of God and the understanding of God, the only way for us to be redeemed, for us to be one with God, for us to be uh, have all those things we talked about a couple of weeks ago, our predestination to be adopted into the family of God, to be like Christ, to be joint heirs with him, and to have that inheritance reserved for us in, in heaven, the only way is by grace, because we can never earn it. We can never deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we would take all the credit, and, and there's nothing we can do. But for grace to abound in your life, this is really important. In order for grace to abound, uh, you have to require grace. And the only way that you require grace is if you come face to face with the fact that we are not perfect. There's none righteous, no, not one. So grace is necessary because of our inability to earn our own salvation or to do what is good. Uh, it's perfectly, beautifully laid out in Romans 12. So if you'll turn with me there, I'm sorry, Romans 5, verse 12. If you'll turn with me there. Romans 5, and we're going to look at verse 12. And this kind of describes man's position and Christ's redemption. And in verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread, death spread to all men because all <clears throat> have sinned. It's, it's clear as could be. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the glory of God being the measuring stick. So this one man is Adam. We see that drop down in, in, into verse number 14. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. So this first man, Adam, um, his sin resulted in mankind inheriting sin and death, the penalty of sin, from Adam, every human being. Uh, but uh, there is one to come that is different than Adam. And that's verse 15. It says, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense, Adam, man died, many died, much more by the grace of God, the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So the, the sin of Adam, the eating of that fruit, uh, resulted in every human being inheriting sin uh, from their earthly father down through the line. Uh, there's none righteous. Uh, on the other hand, the death of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, uh, allowed the grace to abound through many. By one man, we have death and sin. Uh, by the other man, we have life and redemption. Verse 16 of Romans 5. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment that came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. The sin produced death, but the sin also produced the death of Christ. Christ had to die for these many offenses. And the Bible says there is near, no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, he's not condemned, but, but we were already condemned. Look at verse 17. If by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned through one, much more those who receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. For one man, death reigns. And, and we can't get away from it. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. But through the other man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, we have an abundance of grace. There's more grace to go around than sin. That's incredible. Look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience... Many were made sinners. By one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Adam disobeyed, creating a history of mankind with sin. And we talk a lot about what's wrong with the world and why is the world, and there's wars and there's thievery and there's, well, it's all a result because we are sinful beings. We are, we are born that way. But only through the grace of God are we able to function. And by the grace of God, we have now been made righteous. One man creates sin in everybody. One man's death on the cross creates righteousness in everybody who trusts him. Look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So man has, and this is the main point here. Man has a way of denying that they are sinners. We have a way of not needing grace. I'm perfectly fine the way I am. This is how I was born. This is what I do. And this is all good. And I'm not going to call, we're going to call what's evil good and what's good evil. So I don't, I'm just fine. Well, if you're fine, you don't need forgiveness. You don't need redemption. So we have to get to the place where we recognize our sinfulness. So what God did is he instituted the laws of Moses in Exodus. And these laws uh, brought with them consequences. And these laws and their consequences, you know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not lie. And these are the penalties for those things. Well, if there are penalties associated with these things, if we're good people, we're not going to lie, we're not going to commit adultery, we're not going to steal. And even in the midst of these heavy penalties, man still did these things because Moreover, the law entered that the offense may abound. It was God's plan to, to, to show how sin gets carried away. And we're seeing it all over the world. And people get carried away with this sin and violence. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. But God had a plan. 
But here's the problem. If we don't think we need grace, if we don't think we need redemption, we don't ask for it. So God created the law as a school teacher, the Bible says, to show us our need for Christ. Look at verse 21. So as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's enough grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Paul says this in 1 Timothy uh, 1. He says, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. In other words, there was a time where Paul thought he was fine. He thought he was, and God says there'll be a time where people will, will persecute Christians and think they're doing God a favor. And that's Paul in a nutshell before his salvation. But 1 Timothy 1.14, here's what Paul says as a result of this. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. With faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. See, Paul thought he was doing good. He thought he was doing the Lord's work persecuting Christians, arresting Christians. I just want you to take a, just a second to, to fathom the fact that you might be wrong and God might be right. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. That, that if you come to the premise that man is good, but culture, religion, and all those things turned man evil, it's the other way around. Man is, is at the core evil, at the core not good. And we have a need for redemption. We have a need for the Holy Spirit to live within us, to guide us in all truth. We have a need for God's word every day to keep that flesh uh, at bay. And we have a need for the abundance of grace because we continue to flail and fail. And so... Either man is good and, and the culture made it bad, or man is born sinful and God's grace can justify you and wash that sin away. So what a beautiful picture. Look at back in Ephesians chapter one by Jesus Christ, his grace. Look at that verse again, verse nine or verse eight. He made abound towards us in all wisdom. His grace abounds. But you have to confess that you need it. Verse 9 says, having made known to us, this is Ephesians 1, the mystery of his will. And that was the mystery. This mystery has now been revealed. That God created the law to, to show us our need for redemption. And God had a plan to send his only son, who was not born of a man, but born of God, through the womb of a woman. But because he did not have an earthly father born of a virgin, he was able to have a, a pure blood without spot and blemish. So having made known to us the mystery of his will, the plan of salvation, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ Jesus, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So God reveals to us this plan, this plan of salvation, this plan of redemption, this plan of, of grace, this plan of sending his only begotten son to die for us. And this plan has a, an end. And, and that end, if you look at it, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and that word dispensation, a lot of people don't like it. I like it. It's not a bad word. It just means, you know, there. Hebrews 1 tells us that God communicates to us in different times and different methods. Obviously, we are not living in a similar mode of operation to the laws of Moses. We're not living in a similar mode to the Garden of Eden. Uh, we're not living in a similar, we're not bringing bulls and goats to sacrifice them because we're in a different time period and we're post-cross, not pre-cross. 
And so things were different when before Jesus got here. They were different when Jesus was here. They are different now that Jesus has ascended. And they're going to be different after he returns. And so that word dispensation is just a, a, a way God works. It's actually the Greek word is the same word is it, that you would see with home economics. And, and, and that word economics is the same Greek word for dispensation. It's just a mode of operation. Home economics is the, the way you run your home. And the dispensation is how God deals with mankind at a particular time. And there's going to come a time at the end, if you look at this verse again, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when this whole thing is done, that he's going to gather together all things in Christ, those in heaven and those on earth. There's going to be a great gathering. The Bible talks about this uh, many times, and it's what we're looking forward to. I can't wait. I'm so looking forward to it. The Bible talks about it in Mark 13, verse 24. It says, in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in the great power and glory. And then he will send angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth, to the farthest parts of heaven. Isn't that beautiful? He'll send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. That's that idea of the dead in Christ rising and we all join Christ and meet him together. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So in Thessalonians, they were telling them it already happened, and they missed it. You're not going to miss it. It's, it's going to be obvious. But there's going to be a gathering together. And this is why Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what's our hope? The, the only hope this world has, and, and it, it is spiraling down morally and, and, and uh, religiously and all politically. There's, there seems to be a negative spiral for sure. Wars and rumors of wars and Earthquakes and floods and all those things that, that happen in pandemics, and it's difficult. Is there any hope for mankind? Yes, it's the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who in the dispensation of times, when everything is done, he's going to gather everything that's his into one place and separate the tares from the wheats. It's, it's described in First Thessalonians. Remember, they were still concerned about, did they miss it? And in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. So Titus talks about the blessed hope. But if you don't understand, there's a gathering coming. There's a, the, a, a reunion coming. There's a victory coming. Then you live like you have no hope. But we as Christians shouldn't live as if we have no hope. Verse 14 says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. But you got to believe. That's the gospel. Do you believe that Jesus, this, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I need grace from God. And I believe that God died for my sins, was buried with them and rose again without them the third day. I believe that. Well, if you believe that, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, Christians who have died. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. That makes sense. If you've already died as a Christian, you're already with God. But verse 16 says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel 
the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Do you look forward to the gathering? And remember, there's an if in that Thessalonian verse. It's if you believe, which goes on with our verses in Ephesians 1. Um, do you want to be part of this gathering? Are you going to be part of the gathering? I'm going to be part of the gathering. Whether I die and I'm dead in Christ, go first, or whether I'm alive when Jesus returns. Either way, when all of the things are said and done, everything, look at this verse 10 again of Ephesians 1, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, those which are in heaven and those on earth. In other words, the dead in Christ are there first and those who are alive on earth meet him in the air, and finally everything is brought to where it needs to be. Sin is done away with, the enemy is done away with, death is done away with, and everything is set right for eternity. But how do we do that? How do we get there? Look at verse 11 of Ephesians 1. In him we have obtained the inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. I really like that verse. You know, the, the, the question of how do you get saved? Well, I got to do this and I have to do this or I have to believe in Jesus. Uh, Ephesians uh, or Romans 10, 9 says it this way. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Uh, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I like the word trusted. It's I just always have. It gives you a little more because the Bible says, you know, that demons believe that there's a God. They know there's a God, but they just don't trust him. And, and there are people who believe in God today. Uh, many will say, Lord, Lord. And God says, I'll, I said to them, I never knew them. Because you can believe in something and not trust it. Um. But those who trust in Christ, in other words, he says to you, you're a sinner. Okay, then I'm a sinner. If you say I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. I don't, I have enough evidence, by the way, where it's not that hard to believe. And as a sinner, I need redemption. And that redemption comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Do I trust what the scriptures say? I trust Jesus. I trust that he walked on this earth. I trust that he died on a cross. I trust that he was buried in a tomb. And I trust that he rose again the third day. I trust that he's at the right hand of God making intercession for me. And I trust that he's coming back again. I know it. I trust it. In this, verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. In him, verse 13, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Here's the process. I tell you that you're a sinner, according to the Bible, Romans 3.23. I tell you that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. I tell you that Jesus gave you this eternal life by dying on the cross for you while you were still a sinner, Romans 5.8. And I tell you that if you just trust in this and believe that Jesus died for you, that you will abound in the grace of God. That's the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. That's what I just shared with you. In whom we have believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So if you truly trust in what I've just shared with you, what the Bible teaches about salvation, you're sealed. God has, has put his stamp of approval on you. He, and that, that seal at this time was a, a, a seal of ownership. Uh, when they would ship packages or crates, uh, they would take that wax and they would put the seal of the, the, the king or the business on that crate. And that was a, a symbol of ownership, um, a kind of a way of, tr of early tracking uh, packages. But you owned it. When you have put a seal on something, you owned it. 
and God has put on you a seal. Look at verse 14. It is a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So if you hear the word of God and you believe the word of God and you trust the word of God and you trust that, that what we tell you about Jesus is true, then you will be part of this great gathering if you believe uh, that Jesus died and rose again, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. There's proofs of God in history, science, archaeology, creation, culture. His fingerprints are everywhere. So do you believe it and do you trust it? He's returning. And when he returns, it will be unspeakably amazing. Romans 8.18 says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, and there are many, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8 goes on to tell us that, that creation itself is, is yearning and crying out with birth pangs for the return of Christ. Verse 23 of Romans 8 says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope. But this hope is not hope that is seen. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But we hope for what we do not see, and we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We are eagerly waiting, and I'm telling you, it, it's becoming more and more desirable for the Lord to return. Are you going to be part of that gathering? Do you trust in the promises of God? We'll close with John 14, if you'll turn there. So grace abounds. You are unworthy to be part of the gathering, but Christ has made you worthy through his death on the cross. If you trust in these facts, I am a sinner and I need grace. And God says, that's fine. I got more grace than you'll ever need. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And at the end times, I want to reveal this mystery to you. I'm going to gather everything and everybody that's mine into one place where we will be together for eternity. So he says in John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. What's the key that ignites this whole thing? Belief, faith. In my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus says, I, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is our blessed hope. The promise of Jesus Christ himself, who cannot lie, says he has gone to prepare a place and he promises to come and receive us. That where I go you know, in the way you know. Well, Thomas says in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? How do we get to this place that you're talking about? Well, verse 6, Jesus saith to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is the only way? It's what the Bible says. What John 14, 6 says is what Jesus saith. Do you trust it? Do you trust it? You don't have to trust me. I'm, I'm Trust me, I'm not worthy to be trusted. Um, and no human being is because we're all burdened with this sin of, of Adam. None of us are, are unflawed. However, the word of God is perfect. Uh, sanctify, separate us from this. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth, which means separate us from the lies and the junk for what is truth. And thy word is truth. Do you trust it? Do you trust it? Get your eyes off religion. Get your eyes off preachers. Get your eyes off the internet. Get your eyes off uh, all of those things that confuse and get your eyes on the word of God. 
Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Just go to this book and say, okay, I trust it. It's a trustworthy book presented to you many times by untrustworthy people. But it does not belittle the words that are uh, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray there, there's anybody who has had struggles with religion, relationships, or other things, that God, they would turn their attention solely to the scriptures and trust it with all their heart and lean not on their own understanding, that this belief would give them the hope and the, the, the guarantee to be part of this great gathering. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. I mean, thank you for uh, listening. As I'm preaching, it's, it's raining pretty hard outside. So uh, uh, the next day or so is going to be tenuous. Be praying for our community as we pray for you. God bless you.